Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 Utah Wind Communications Virtual Conference, session number four. Tonight, we will be hearing from Major Mike Collette. He is the Director of Communications for the Utah Wind. We appreciate you taking your time tonight to listen to this and to watch, and we hope that you'll learn from it. Just some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, please put them into the Q&A portion of the broadcast and I will take care of them from there. Um, if you have any other questions in there um, for Mike, then go ahead and put those in there also. We also have um, Lieutenant Colonel Kent Hopkins from Rocky Mountain Region on this uh, broadcast. He will also be there to help answer questions and uh, possibly speak to us on some of these things tonight. So appreciate you all being here and here is Major Collette. And good evening, and thanks, uh, Mike and uh, Ken. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to have some fun and uh, talk about the Technosonic aircraft radio, the VHF FM radio that's used to talk to uh, Civil Air Patrol repeaters and ground stations on the FM channels. And sometimes we get a little put off by the Technosonic because it's a little different than what's usually used for the uh, aircraft radios talking to air traffic control. And so our goal tonight is to demystify the Technosonic radio. And whether you're young or old, we always identify with things that we sometimes understand well, we sometimes understand not so well, and we sometimes are mystified. So the goal tonight is to demystify the Technosonic radio, which is located right there. This is the 182 panel, and it's uh, pretty much the same for the uh, 206 and the 172. Uh, that's the VHF FM radio we're going to be talking about tonight. And there it is in all its glory. Lots of knobs and buttons, and what I want to do tonight is try to get you familiar with some of the idiosyncrasies of the radio and actually make it more of an old friend to you so that on a mission you won't have to think about what you're doing to operate the radio. It will be more automatic and uh, more trouble free for you. It's a very powerful radio. It can do a lot of different things and uh, so let's go explore. We actually have three models of the Technosonic in our aircraft as they evolved over time as we bought the aircraft from the old 28 Kilo uh, to the newer 182s and the 206 and the newest uh, 172. The one that on top, the plain old TDFM 136, which is its formal name, is the radio used in uh, our 182s. Uh, 28 Kilo, 58 Charlie Papa, 53490. The A model, which is the one in the middle, is extremely similar. The operation is actually identical, and it's in 259. And the newest model, the B model, is in the 206 and in the 172. So something that is going to help remember a couple of key differences in the radios is all the radios and all the 182s behave exactly alike. The only thing that's different, and there are a couple of key differences that we really need to learn to be able to operate the radio. And we've had sorties where people can't talk on the radio because they don't understand one key difference here. Uh, the 206 and the 172 are a little bit different because the volume control and on-off switch is a push button and not just a rotary control for the on-off switch. And the radio has a nasty habit of coming in, of coming on when you turn it on with the volume full down. And so we have people missing radio checks because they don't know that their volume's turned down. We had one sortie in uh, the COVID flights down to the Four Quarters areas that we were trying to make contact with they couldn't hear us, and we finally uh, sent a text and say, turn up your Technosonic volume, and then everything worked just fine. So we're going to learn enough to stay out of that pitfall tonight. Powering on the Technosonic radio, 
Uh, there's four switches in the chain between the battery and the alternator and the radio. Two of these are normally going to be taken care of on the pre-flight, master switch on, and avionics bus on, particularly avionics bus two. That's where the mission master power is located. And it's kind of hard to see behind the yoke. I couldn't get a really good picture of that uh, mission master DC panel, which is right underneath the technosonic radio. But uh, on the left side is the mission master. That turns on the power to all the rest of the circuit breakers and switches on this panel. And so that uh, interrupts the power to the technosonic. So mission master on and technosonic radio on. So mission master and technosonic are really the two things that an observer will want to remember uh, to power up the technosonic radio to do that radio check uh, prior to taxi. <clears throat> the audio, the receive audio and the uh, microphone control for the technosonic is on COM3. Here's the uh, third audio panel, the observer's audio panel that's visible here. So COM3 to transmit on the technosonic, COM3 to listen on the technosonic radio. Technosonic's on COM3. Now here are the two significant differences between the 136, 136A and the B models. The older radios have just the kind of thing you used to have on the old time radios, on off switch and the volume control. Uh, just very simple, click off, click on, and then one 270 degree turn to adjust the volume. The newer B model uh, has the push on, push off switch. And then there are detents on the knob and the volume control clicks over 360 degrees. So it just clicks up and it clicks down. So it could come on at full down volume. Uh, so just make sure that when you click the B model on, again in the 206 and the 172, give the knob a few uh, twists clockwise to make sure that you've got some volume uh, to uh, do a radio check with. I'm going to go back a slide. Notice there's a squelch button here on the left side on the older model radios. You can push that and open the squelch, kind of like you do on a nav radio to hear the identifier and, identi and positively identify the nav aid we used to on the VOR stations. Well, they've eliminated the squelch button on the B model, that's the little cover you can see right there, the little pull-off cover for the mini DIN connector to do the programming of the radio. So there's no squelch button, which is unfortunate in the B model radio because that was a really handy feature to be able to do a volume check. So what you need to do is, you know, listen to another station respond to you uh, to do the radio check in the, the 206 and the 172. So let's talk about the, uh, the displays on the radio. There's a lot of information there and I want to try to boil it down. You know, just flying the G1000, you know, you, you, you get up there for the first time and you're on overload because uh, there's so much information being presented. In fact, when I was trying to check out in a G1000, uh, Kent Wright, who was my instructor at the time, kept covering up the backup, the three backup analog instruments, because I kept looking at them because I could get information faster there than from the G1000 display, because there's just so much information there. So let's just go through it line by line, and again, try to demystify what's going on here. The main channel display is on the top, and over here on the left side, there's the, uh, the transmitter switch, main or guard channel. And here we've got the main channel selected and we're seeing the main channel information on top. When you're in the guard position, there's a, uh, we're, we're looking at the lower display and now the uh, guard one and guard two switch come into play because it's a two channel receiver. Uh, the top one, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, let's see, let me get my, there we go. The guard channel is on the bottom display. 
and there's two channels, guard one and guard two. Those of you that have flown in the, with the Technosonics probably remember, but not everyone may, that G1, guard one, is the cap guard channel. G2 is the TAC-1 channel, because sometimes uh, you want to be able to transmit on TAC-1 um, without dialing it into the radio, because you want to leave the repeater channel up on the radio. So that just is another feature, but just another thing to remember, that there's two different possibilities on the guard channels. So if you want to talk on CAP guard, you just need to make sure that that uh, center switch is in the guard one position. So cap guard in guard one, tack one in guard two. And you'll also see that uh, represented in the display. Now this is, a, this is a commercial channel. That's the Federal Fire Air Guard channel that's showing up there because all of the visuals I've got on the G1000 are taken from some uh, federal training materials from the Interagency Fire Center in Boise. All right, let's walk left to right across the display. The first three digits are your channel number. And you'll see channel 001 on top and guard one on the bottom. So that's the channel number that you're on. Then there's the channel description, which will be a plain language description. It'll say Air 1 or Air 2 or CC1 or CC2 or TAC1 or R47 or R58. That'll be the channel description. Uh, moving over to the right, you've got your actual frequency readout. The megahertz and the kilohertz. And then at the end, you'll have a little R or an X. It'll be R when you're receiving, and when you key the transmitter, that will change to a T, and then it will show the transmit frequency. Of course, on the repeater, they're different. On simplex, they're the same. So that's what the R or the T means at the end of the, uh, the frequency digits. Mike? Yes. We have a question. Someone wants to know what guard refers to. The question is, what does guard refer to? Is it similar to standby channel? Uh, no. That's uh, the really good question. Um, the standby channel, I think you may be referring to the alternate uh, frequency you dial in to your aircraft radio that's on standby. So if you're talking to the ground control, you generally have, or clearance delivery, you'll have ground in there. And if you're taxing out talking on ground, you'll probably have the tower dialed into the standby frequency. When you get to hold short, and finish your run up, you just punch it over and, and now the tower becomes the active frequency. The Technosonic does not operate that way. It does not have a standby channel. Guard is the second receiver that you're always guarding, hence the name, while you're listening to the primary channel. So all aircraft in the US are generally required to monitor the guard channel in the background on a separate receiver. The Technosonic has two separate receivers in it, main and guard. So the guard channel is a simultaneous receive channel you're listening to so that those folks in other aircraft are on the ground will try to reach you on that if they can't reach you on any other channel because they assume that regardless of what else you're doing with the radio, you'll be listening to that common guard channel. If you're sitting down in the comm room at wing headquarters, uh, you'll notice there's a, an airband uh, VHF AM radio in there uh, tuned up on guard 121.5. And if you turn up the volume, listen during the day, even the big boys, the big iron, uh, gets the knobs twisted sometimes and you hold them coming up and saying, Delta 568, please contact uh, tower on guard because they've, uh, they've lost the channel they're supposed to be on or misdialed it and they can't talk to them. So they haul around the guard channel because they know that everybody's also listening there. So uh, when you have a chance, uh, shoot a note back to Lieutenant Dyke if that was not uh, a good explanation for you. It's a simultaneous channel that's a common channel that everybody listens to all of the time. Back to the uh, top display, that little letter prior to the frequency tells you what kind of a mode is programmed into your radio, whether it's narrowband, 
a wideband analog or P25 digital with a D. Now the Technosonic actually has mixed mode receivers, just like our Johnson's do. It doesn't operate exactly the same way, but it does have mixed mode receiver, uh, but you will be transmitting on the mode that you have dialed into the channel on the radio, just like the Johnson's. There's a separate set of analog and digital channels. So this tells you the mode that's programmed into the radio for that channel that you're on. The little uh, alphanumeric character right at the end of the display tells you the type of squelch that's programmed into the radio. These aren't things you really have to worry about as an operator on the Technosonic. What you're really going to worry about is, you know, what channel you've got selected over here. Uh, that's really the only thing you need to worry about on the display. Uh, this is really something to help uh, pr those of us that are programming the radio and updating some of the channels in them, whether it's just a noise operated squelch, a tone squelch, or a digital squelch. So that's just the squelch type. So let's see. Well, we talked about the fact that the Technosonic has two receivers, the main channel and the guard channel. The main channel has 230 different programmable channels. We have 228 programmed in Utah Wing. And the guard channel, as you now know, has two channels. Uh, each receiver has a separate volume control, so you can adjust the levels uh, separately. The squelch button on the on the, the plane and the A models, everything except the D models, opens the squelch of both receivers. So that's a really easy way to number one, set the volume, and number two, uh, check the fact that you've got receiver audio when you go to do a, a radio check on the pre-taxi uh, radio check. So that's the squelch button on all but the newest model radios. We talked about the fact that there's a single transmitter, so you have to switch it between main and guard with the button on the left, and then guard one or guard two with the center toggle switch. So one transmitter, two receivers, kind of like an elephant. The Technosonic also has a power select, just like your Johnson's do. Uh, the Technosonic has a 10 watt transmitter on high power and a one watt transmitter on low power. Now you're generally going to want to operate in the, you know, in the mountainous areas in the 10 watt position of the high power. And there's just one exception when we'll generally want to go to low power. And we'll talk about that toward the tail end of the presentation. But that's the power select button. Something else to check on uh, pre-flighting the Technosonic radio. Switch that up to high power. Now we get into the push buttons. All the push buttons are dual function. They do more than one thing. The first time you push the button, it's listening for the button as a command rather than a number or a digit. And up here in the top left, you'll see the command function of the, of the one button is channel, channel select. The two and eight buttons turn the display brighter or dimmer. So it's not channel up and down, it's display bright or display dim. And then the channel, uh, you can increment the channels down or up, four to go down and six to go up. So you can change the channels up and down that way. Um, that's one way to move from one repeater channel to save for another if you're on R58 and you're taking off from Salt Lake and you're flying down south and you want to switch over to R47, you can push the, the four button a few times until you see R47 in the display. But that's the uh, channel up and down buttons. You have to remember that because they're not labeled that way. Now here's the direct channel entry. This is what most of us do on the Technosonic. Um, so, you, and here's the sequence of events. There's five buttons to push. Channel, one, five, eight, enter. Uh, the analog repeater channel is a little easier to remember because you just have to add a one. So channel 58, uh, R58 is channel 158. 
R47 is channel 147. So channel 158, enter to enter the R58 repeater. Now you have to be careful. This is where you really have to be careful with the technosonic. And we've run into this, particularly on the COVID missions, where we had single crew member missions. We had a pilot and no observer. And the pilot would have to reach clear across the instrument panel and push buttons, which of course is a big tractor from SCAN. Um, you had to reach clear across and press five buttons to change channels and then have to check the display to make sure you've got the right one selected. You didn't push the wrong button. It's really easy, you know, when you're reaching clear across the panel to push a wrong button. So this is really the biggest caveat on the Technosonic. Because again, if you press mode or program or squelch or frequency, particularly frequency, the next buttons you push are actually changing the information that's programmed into the radio. And so if you push the wrong one, it can take you to Never Never Land. And it's hard to communicate out of Never Never Land. And we've had, uh, we've, we've had several folks run into this. And Lieutenant Colonel Hopkins, you mentioned in our, uh, our startup that uh, if you want to recount the experience you had when you went to use the Technosonic and found it in Never Never Land. If you're asking for me to admit my mistakes. Uh, no, I will I'm do not that asking freely. for you to admit your mistake. I'm asking <laughs> just for you to you know explore what you ran into. And it may have been an aircraft that came from another wing, but you ran into something you weren't expecting on a particular channel on the Technosonic, as I remember. Yes, sir. It was a combination of a couple of things. The first was that I attempted to do the immediate channel entry and and it gave me a, a weird result. And I looked down at the panel and said, wait a minute, it shouldn't look like that. And what I discovered was that I had indeed put it in uh, channel select mode and then punched in the three digit channel number and hit enter. But someone had already gone in in the programming mode and changed the frequency for for the transmit receive pair or the tone. And so I had an inoperative radio, no, no joy at all. Bottom line, I needed to turn the radio off and turn it back on to be sure that I was starting from a known good condition and then repeated that and verified that I indeed had a programmed radio, a, 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 a reprogrammed radio. And I did not have the skill to hit the PGM button and fix it. So I found alternate means. I have another question. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question is, if you push a wrong button, is there a get out of jail button that takes you back to where you were before entering Never Never Land? There is indeed. You can either just stop what you're doing because anything that you do will not change the radio until you hit the enter button. So if you discover yourself pushing a wrong button, just stop. And after about five seconds, it will time out and go back to the condition it was in before you started uh, pressing any buttons. Or you could just like a computer, that lower right hand button, you can press the escape button to take you back to where you were. So helpful question, thanks. And uh, thanks Kent. Uh, I think we've, we may have all run into that once upon a time. I know there's two folks in the wing that can help you if you ever do get into that situation and you can somehow get in touch with us. Jerry Wellman and myself can talk you through reestablishing the original correct channel information in flight if that ever becomes a problem. It's not something we recommend because it's easy to cause even more problems, but it's something we have done in the past. So uh, let's go from, uh, from making mistakes to good operating practice. Check the volume control now. Again, uh, use the squelch button, except in the 172 and the 206. Do a uh, ground radio check prior to every flight. There are not always folks monitoring the local repeater. I know down at, uh, at uh, Spanish Fork in Provo, folks are generally monitoring R47. And we're getting more folks on the air over the next couple of months that will also be monitoring R58. Uh, I know when the, we used to fly out of Logan, somebody was almost always standing by on R42. Uh, so, and in Ogden, sometimes it's easier to get into R41 
And so one thing to think about is if you got a sortie, uh, arrange to have somebody, one of your buddies or one of the squadron members or one of the uh, wing communicators standing by on the repeater to help you with your ground radio check because that's a downer for a, for a SAR sortie, an admission sortie, if you don't have a functioning FM radio. So we really want to make sure that's, uh, that's working. And to do the radio check, the first thing you'll do, you'll key the radio and you'll look for this little green light to the left of the, the uh, display on the main channel to come on. That shows you when you're receiving an RF carrier uh, from another station. And you know there's a little squelch tail, that little uh, feature where a repeater stays on for about two seconds after you unkey the microphone. So key up, say on R47 or R58, unkey, look for that little green light to come on. That's the first indication that you're uh, actually hitting that repeater. And then you can go ahead and, uh, and, and call for a radio check on that repeater. So the little green light means you're receiving a signal from another station on that channel. And that'll be on for as long as the other station is transmitting or as long as the repeater is transmitting with that little two second delay. We're going to uh, spend about four or five minutes now on a little bit of a review that was put together by our good friends in Colorado Wing on the Technosonic Radio. So let's see if we can get that to, to happen How to here. How stop buffering We'll get anytime, past a little ad here. Instantly. This video will cover the basic operation of the VHF FM radio installed in most CAP aircraft. This radio is known as the CAP VHF FM radio. The technical specifications is that it is a Technosonics TDFM 136 radio. To power it on, first make sure the aircraft avionics are powered up. Then simply turn the volume control for the main channel from the off position to an on position. In this case, we'll rotate it so the line is simply facing straight up and down. That's a good starting position. The radio will take a moment to boot up. When the radio power is on, it will either start up on a predefined channel set in the radio programming or on the last used channel. If you wish to change the startup behavior of your radio, work through your squadron communications officer to arrange for radio reprogramming. The VHF FM radio is capable of listening to two channels at once. In this case, you'll notice on the display a top line and a bottom line. The top line shows the main channel and the bottom line shows the guard channel. You can hear both channels at the same time. However, you can only transmit on one at a time. To choose which channel you want to transmit on, you need to check the position of this main and guard switch. It's just below the volume control for the main channel. If the switch is in the up position, it's set to main, and that means your radio will transmit on the channel on the top line of the display. If you change it to the guard position, then your radio will transmit on the channel shown in the guard position or the bottom row of the display. All aircrew members should be able to change the channels on the TDFM radio. To change the channel on the main part of the display or the top part, press the channel button followed by the channel number. In this case, I'm going to go to th channel 31. So I press channel 0, 3, 1, enter. The radio changes to that channel. 
to change back to channel 125, I press channel and then 125, enter. The radio changes to that channel. You can also change the channel for the guard portion of the radio or the bottom display. You only have two choices, guard one and guard two, as determined by the switch under the guard volume control. As you flip the switch, that channel changes. Another feature radio operators should be aware of is the ability to change the power on the radio from low to high and vice versa. That's the switch under the squelch button. Right here, you can change the radio from high power to low power. Most of the time, you should be operating on low power. Occasionally, you may need to use high power so people can hear you at longer ranges. When you're done using the radio, you should turn it off. That's done the same way you turned it on. Same switch, the main volume control, simply rotate that to the left until it clicks to the off position. And then the radio is turned off. That concludes the training on all the basic operational features of the TDFM 136 radio, the CAP VHF FM radio installed in most CAP aircraft. Blue Mesa 4-2, out. <laughs> okay. All right, here is the uh, channel organization. I mentioned that the uh, radio could have up to 230 channels programmed into the main channel. Here's how we have the uh, radios organized in Utah Wing. Uh, these uh, laminated reference cards are available. We've been handing them out at the Technosonic briefings at the Wing conferences. Uh, we can email you one, you can print out, laminate it, put it on your kneeboard. And as we get to them, we're going to be putting them in the aircraft binders for all the aircraft. We're making a program update over the next couple of months. The national headquarters has changed the national template, and they've put some of these federal uh, interoperability channels in different places. We've had them in ahead of time. And so over time, we're going to be moving these a few places just to conform with the national code plug. So the analog repeater channels are easy to remember. Channel 141 for R41, 142 for R42, et cetera. And here are all of the channels on this card, not that are in the radio, but the ones that we probably use the most. All of the Utah wing repeater channels and then some of the neighboring states repeater channels. Um, one of those that we use, which is actually administrated by Colorado Wing, is R20, which is on a Bajo Peak down by Monticello, which provides excellent coverage to southeastern Utah. And we were actually, I was actually able to talk to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Max Kiefer when he was on the ground at Cayente Airport with the uh, COVID uh, supplies for the Navajo Nation uh, through the uh, linked repeater system in Colorado. But this is the, the channel lineup for the Utah wing repeaters, the channel number and the repeater number. The digital channels aren't quite so obvious because again, there's only so many channels in the radio and we have to keep going up in uh, numbers so channel 205S is R41P for P25 digital, 206 for R42 digital, et cetera. The little S is some nomenclature in the radio that you may or may not see. Don't be put off by it. Just worry about the, the channel number like 205, 206, 211, and 222. That's just a programming feature in the radio to use the same frequency information from a prior channel and uh, take up less memory on the chip and the radio so we get more channels programmed into it. So just look at the three leading digits here uh, and that will tell you the, the channel that you're worried about, like channel uh, 196 for Monroe Peak, for R32P down at Richfield, et cetera. Just look at the first three digits of the channel number. So the, the analog ones are easy to remember 
the digital ones you're probably going to have to look up on each mission if we switch over to the digital mode, which we'll do more of over time. A couple channels up here, Federal Fire Guard, that's the guard channel used by all of the uh, national firefighting assets uh, air for the Forest Service BLM or contractors. That's their guard channel they use when they're doing wildland fire support. Uh, channel 99 is the special channel we have programmed in when we're working with the Army National Guard's helicopters, their Apaches, their Blackhawks, or Lakotas. When we have our link set up on the ground, we'll dial up that channel so our pilots can talk to directly to the uh, Apache and the Blackhawk and the Lakota pilots on the joint operations. Back on the left-hand side, the hybrid repeater channels are up front. You know, we didn't make that determination in Utah Wing. That was made by the National Headquarters staff, and we just have to conform to their channels, except for those we can program in ourselves, which are the state and local channels down here in the salmon-colored boxes. I get questions on every single mission. Where's R70? Because we dialed in at 170 and that's not R70. Well, no, R70 is channel 9, 009. And the uh, digital version is channel 22. So channel 9 for R70 is one you probably want to remember. Uh, one of the, let's see, let's talk about the other common channel we generally will use in working with a uh, county government, uh, the Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team, the National SAR Channel, that's on channel 27. And uh, this information is all, well, let's see, I'm gonna skip, uh, I'm gonna wait uh, on my next comment for, and fill another couple of slides. So channel 27, 027, you have to dial in three digits for the National Search and Rescue Channel in the Technosonic. Now, any use of these state and local or federal liaison channels, um, we use those only when we're working with another agency in support of that agency and only by the request of that agency and with approval from our IC. We really can't be transmitting on these channels because the state is using these for their own operations. And here on the right hand side in the blue are the federal and incident response uh, frequencies. Like uh, channel 85 IR5 is the simplex incident calling frequency that could be used in say a major event like an earthquake. You know, those kinds of things were used down at Katrina. Um, we have simplex and tactical repeaters used in federal incident response. Here down here in the 90s, are the uh, the marine channels labeled Coast Guard 06 for SAR messages. Coast Guard channel 16 is the marine emergency channel. It's kind of like our 121.5 in aircraft. And if you're ever on an inland waterway or uh, say you're on the Columbia River or anywhere there's uh, a lot of marine activity, that's kind of used as a hailing channel and also to broadcast uh, weather warnings and uh, major ship traffic warnings from the Coast Guard. That's channel 16. And these are other channels that only CAP can use, civilians can't use these, to work with uh, Coast Guard assets on marine. And you say, well, where, gosh, where, where would we do that in Utah? Well, there's a, there's a Coast Guard power squadron up on Bear Lake. And we actually worked with uh, Cache County and Rich County and did a joint exercise a couple of years ago to actually did some DFing to emergency personal locator beacons on boats out in Bear Lake. We actually DFed them and then vectored in the, uh, the Coast Guard Auxiliary to effect a rescue on Bear Lake. Mike, um, someone yes. asked where they can find that laminated list. I don't remember, did you say there's one in each aircraft? No, we've been handing them out to pilots and observers at the wing conferences. And so if you'd like one, please let me know. And I can email you the uh, the, power, the Adobe slide to print one off for yourself. It's got the uh, channel information, the Utah repeater map, and also those the functions of the different buttons on it. So just uh, send those requests to me and I can send you the file and you can print one out for yourself. Just remember that that 
the list is for official use only. That's correct. We don't share that outside the organization. Now, there are. Hey, yes. Mike, we got another question. Question sure. is, are repeaters connected on a net? So someone talking in a repeater in Southern Utah gets rebroadcast in Northern Utah, or do the repeaters just rebroadcast locally? That's a good question. Unfortunately, we cannot link our repeaters. Uh, the Air Force uh, will, and MTIA, which is the, uh, the, uh, the licensing agency for all federal radio users, kind of equivalent to the FCC for civilians, the MTIA will not give us a UHF channel with which to link our repeaters. So the repeaters are all standalone. What we're doing, uh, and we should be getting our first systems within the next couple of months, we're implementing a system called ReadyUp, uh, which is a system that the state of Utah uses for emergency management. It will give us the ability to talk over any of our repeaters using a cell phone, a tablet, uh, a PC, you know, any personal communicating device. We will actually have um, voice over internet protocol, VoIP access to little nodes and locations talking to each of our repeaters. And there's actually kind of a dispatch console you can set up on your device and just tap with uh, your thumb or finger or mouse and transmit on that repeater. Or you can select several up and transmit on several repeaters simultaneously. Now that's something that uh, we're going to be putting in place. It's going to take us two years probably to get uh, the little individual nodes in place that we can access. That you know we have to put one in a location that has access to a repeater with the radio wave, and also has internet access, emergency power access, and is in a secure location. It's going to take us a while to get all those uh, sites. Um, put together with different uh, agencies and sponsors. We have requests in for five systems to be able to remotely access R41, 42, 58, 47, and then 38 down at Price uh, because we have node sites located for those situated. The others are going to be coming over time. So unfortunately, the repeaters aren't linked. However, once we get ReadyUp system going, anybody that's got a secure login from CAP can be able to log in to any chosen repeater and will actually be able to do statewide nets that way, which will be really kind of cool. So it's something we wish we could do, but like the hams can, you know, they have linked repeater systems all up and down the state. Uh, I was down in Canyonlands uh, last fall at a campground talking to some friends up in Salt Lake, coordinating some logistics on linked repeater systems. But unfortunately, we can't do that in CAP. We're making progress though. When I was a cadet and early senior member way back in my first trip through CAP decades ago, they wouldn't let us use FM on VHF. They wouldn't let us use any repeaters. And some of you probably know that Utah Wing was the first wing in the nation that had an official repeater put on the air, you know, again, because of our mountainous terrain. Thanks, so, Mike. so, one, one yes. more question. And, and then I have to sign off for another responsibility. Yes, so thanks. I'm going to combine, combining two questions. Can we get a URL out for the video? That's question one. And what is the method that you want to get requests for that list? That, uh, that laminated card, uh, the electronic version. Just just have your squadron communications officer forward uh, request to me and I'll get it out. And I already posted the URL for that training video on the Q&A. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna sign off. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks uh, to run off for, for joining tonight. Appreciate that. Yes, thank you for leading us through this. Great, <laughs> okay. great job uh, report. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take care. Um, the information, the channel information, both for the EF Johnson radios and the Technosonic is on the ICS-205. That's the communication plan that's loaded up to the mission in Wimmers for every mission, whether it's a SARX or an actual mission. You'll find that channel information on the 205 as a mission file. And so it might be a good idea for the air crew to have the observer print that 205 out 
and have it with you on the mission so you have all that information close at hand. So it's also available, say for instance, uh, R58 here, uh, Air Tech Channel 158, et cetera. So we talked about the high-low power switch on the Technosonic, and so there's really only one, one uh, situation where we need to worry about that in Utah Wing. I know the video says to generally operate in the low power position. That policy is established by Flatlanders down there in uh, Maxwell and you know Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, and uh, they don't understand the difficulty we have in communicating because of mountains. Uh, as you well know, that if you've been out on a mission because of our mountains, you'll be out there flying at a 1,000 AGL and you'll have to pop up four or 5,000 feet to hit a repeater to make a radio check on occasion. So that's why in Utah Wing, we say, hey, leave it in the high power position because you'll have more success with it because of all our mountainous terrain. The one time that we want to go to low power though is when you're flying a hybrid repeater, the portable repeater in the back seat of the aircraft. The antenna for the repeater uh, that you plug into with that little BNC connector in the, in the right hand back seat, the starboard seat, is only about two feet away from the antenna that's connected to the Technosonic radio. So what happens is uh, if you're flying the hybrid repeater and it's listening on R70 and you're transmitting back to home plate on R47 or R58 and you key your Technosonic at 10 watts, even with all the filtering in the repeater, that signal is millions of times more powerful than the signal it's trying to hear on its channel. So even with all the best filtering in the world, and this is some pretty, I mean, that's a $18,000 repeater. You know, that's pretty high tech stuff, but still that's enough brute force that your signal, because of the way an FM radio works, will take over, even though it's on a different frequency, from the frequency the repeater is trying to listen to, and the repeater will miss hearing the calls on the repeater channel. So, just something to remember, when flying the hybrid repeater, operate the Technosonic radio in the low power position, just leave it down in low, uh, for as much of the communications as you can do, and only flip it up to high power in those situations where perhaps you need to avoid a climb out. You know, it'll take another 10 minutes to climb up and 10 minutes to drift back down uh, to make an ops normal check. So that's the one time we're going to want to use low on the Technosonic radio is when, we're on, when you're also operating a hybrid uh, portable repeater. So, to echo the words of our, uh, our commander, uh, Colonel Fernandez, with this information, let's go forward with purpose. And that completes the, uh, the formal uh, presentation tonight. Uh, please shoot us a note by email or, other, or any last minute chats. Uh, we'll, we'll take a standby for any other questions or comments or even suggestions that you might have from your experiences in operating the Technosonic radio. Not seeing anything so far. Okay. Well, uh, please, please feel free to reach out after the fact if something comes to mind. If you wake up at 3 a.m. and say, oh, I wish I'd asked that question, uh, please give us a shout. Again, the purpose is to demystify the use of that technosonic radio and uh, really uh, give us the best chance of, of operating that proficiently and correctly on missions because it's it's all about mission readiness. Thanks for spending your time, by the way, to tune in on these uh, communication sessions we're doing this year in lieu of the spring uh, in-person communications conference, which we typically hold uh, for obvious reasons. So thanks for, for dedicating some of your evening and uh, listening to the uh, discussion on the Technosonic. I hope this was useful. I hope that everybody, regardless of your experience level with the Technosonic picked up maybe maybe one point tonight, uh, something that you might not have known before. And if that's happened, then uh, 
then I'll consider this a success. So thanks for your interest. Thanks for your dedication and work with Civil Air Patrol. Uh, be safe out there. And we'll talk to you on the next event. And thank you for uh, Lieutenant Dyke for all of the groundwork to organize the technical aspects of our team's meetings. And thanks also to Major David Rhodes in Logan, who actually put together the content and lined up the presenters uh, for this virtual communications conference. And a good evening to everyone. Thank you, Mike, very much. Um, and just so you all know, our next session, session number five, will be next Thursday evening at 1930 local time. In that session, we will be, we'll have two presenters. The first one will be Lieutenant Colonel um, Jason Hess. He will be talking about the new SpotX device uh, that we will be putting in the aircraft. And the second presenter will be myself, and I will talk about the, um, the communications log in Wimmers and logging uh, VHF radio traffic as well as the SpotX message traffic. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight and hope you have a wonderful evening. Good day.